we also realize the greater spiritual warfare will be. Ephesians chapters 5 and 6. And so your prayers are greatly appreciated as we continue to pray for one another and uh, God's work through us as a local body of believers. And that's why I'd like you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles as we continue our study in the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, because you see, Paul continues his instruction there on just how the church should conduct itself. And you know, paramount in this instruction is the dire need for servant leaders. Leaders who provide help and guidance for the benefit of others, just like you have selected the pastor search team to do that, just like you have selected the elders to do that, and, uh, and many numerous other ministry leaders. So here in chapter 3, Paul lays out the qualifications and responsibilities for the various groups of leaders. In the first seven verses, he talks about the responsibilities of elders. And then in verses uh, 8 through 13, he talks about the responsibilities of deacons. And then the latter part of the chapter, in verses 14 through 16, he lays out the responsibility for believers, that is, for you and me and for the rest of us. And so this morning, I'd like us to look at each of these groups of people and to find out what it really takes in regard to servant leadership. First of all, what does it take for elders to exercise servant leadership? We know that Paul teaches about the plurality of elders. There, there's not just one. There's, there's, there's a, a number of elders, plural. They are called by the Holy Spirit. They are recognized by other elders and people. Uh, and their duties, of course, involve overseeing and shepherding the flock, uh, guarding the truth, and general oversight of, of the work. And so Paul lays out here in this passage, verses 1 through 9, or 1 through uh, 7, about the qualifications and responsibilities that they have. We've talked about this when we studied the book of Titus in chapter 1. But Paul expands on it just a little bit more in these verses, where he lists 15 qualifications for the office of elder. Follow with me, if you would, as we read this. It says, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, that's the word for elders, he desires a noble task. Let me stop there for a moment. If you desire, and you have the qualifications, and you desire, that's noble. That's very noble, and you should be encouraged to do that. We as a church, you as a congregation will be selecting, you'll be uh, providing a nominating committee in the next uh, uh, month or two here, and you will be, uh, and they'll be delegated to find we need a couple more elders uh, that you will be selecting this fall, probably at the trimester in October. Uh, but that's coming up, and that's why it's so important uh, we review what is being said here. So in verse 2, it says, Therefore an overseer or an elder must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunker, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert 
or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. And moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Just touching on these 15, it's a review, but he must be above reproach. That's kind of an overall quality for all of the rest of them. It means that he, he is not perfect. We all know that. None of us are. Not perfect, but rather men of good reputation. And then if married, it says here that the elder is to be the husband of one wife. What is very clear about this statement, although there's been much discussion about what it means to be uh, the husband of one wife, it definitely means he must be someone who maintains moral purity. And that's the clarity that we need to keep in mind. Furthermore, it says that he must be sober-minded. That simply means to be temperate, to be uh, well-balanced in words and action. And number four, he needs to be self-controlled or prudent, that is, wise and humble. Number five, respectable, serving as a good role model. Number six, hospitable, literally given to hospitality. In other words, demonstrating unselfishness and, and generosity. Number seven, a very important qualification is that the elder must be able to teach. Now, this is not required of deacons, but it is required of elders to have that ability to be able to handle the scriptures. As, as Gene Getz would say, to communicate sensitively and in a non-threatening and non-defensive manner. Uh, boy, sometimes that, that, that can be a real challenge. And, uh, but by God's grace, elders must be able to understand and communicate the truth to others and gently be able to refute those who mishandle it. And certainly we realize that not all teaching is done publicly. Uh, much of it is done just privately or informally. And yet elders need to at least possess that aptitude for handling God's word with skill. And then number eight, uh, elders must not be given to drunkenness, uh, not addicted to substances. Number nine, elders must not be violent. They must not be abusive. Number 10, elders rather must be gentle, forbearing, making room for others, giving others some slack, grace, extending grace. You know, that's a display really of the fruit of the Spirit, to be able to be loving and kind and gentle. And again, by the grace of God. Number 11, he must not be quarrelsome or uncontentious, meaning that they should be non-argumentative and non-divisive. That doesn't mean there isn't rigorous discussion at times. There is. And differences of opinion and things to work out. But they have that ability and strength to be able to talk things through and to be able to work well and finally seek the Lord's will and direction and come to that. Number 12, the elders need to be free from the love of money. In other words, non-materialistic. 13, the elders, let me camp on this a little bit. Verses 4 and 5, the elders must be able to manage his family and household well. Paul specifically focuses here on the leader's management of his children. How do the children view their father as a leader? Uh, do they respect his leadership? As a father, does he exercise his authority lovingly in the home? Is he able to lead his family with con without that you know, constant fussing and clamoring? Paul makes an analogy here between management of a home and leadership in the church. 
Many of the same skills are needed for both, and therefore success in the family may well indicate success in a church. And that's why this qualification. Two more. Number 14. He must not be a recent convert, not a new Christian. He must be, have been given the time to grow and to mature in the faith, according to verse 6. And now, finally, we come to verse 7. The elder must have a good reputation with outsiders. That is a good testimony, even to unbelievers. Where it says... He must be well thought of by outsiders that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. The commentator Dwayne Lifton writes these words, Church leaders as representatives of the congregation are constantly susceptible to the snares of the devil. Satan likes nothing better than to disgrace God's word, his work, and God's people by trapping church leaders in sin before a watching world. And that's why it's important, therefore, that the overseers, the elders, achieve and maintain a good reputation before unbelievers. And that's why leaders also need your prayers for protection from the evil one. They need your prayers for wisdom and strength to lead and serve people in doing God's work. Leaders need one another for accountability and mutual encouragement. And this is what it takes for elders to exercise servant leadership in order to help and to guide others for their benefit and for the well-being of the whole body. The responsibilities of the elders what it takes. Secondly, in servant leadership, what does it take then for deacons to exercise servant leadership? As you know, there are two primary leadership offices in the church. They are specifically elders and deacons. There is a prototype of their ministry that is actually found back in uh, Acts chapter 6 in their early church where there was a situation that came up that the disciples were increasing in number and there was a complaint that came up among the Hellenistic, that is the Greek-speaking Jews that rose against the Hebrew-speaking people. Because what happened? Their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so the 12 summoned the full number of disciples and they said, look, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men full of repute or full of faith full of the spirit of, and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty and we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that's exactly what they did. And then the text goes on to say, these they set before the apostles and they prayed, laid their hands on them. And what happened? And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multitude, multiplied greatly. That's why the role of the deacons is so important. In the book of Philippians, Paul addresses the church at Philippi, including, he says, the overseers or the elders and the deacons. Who are these deacons? And what do they do? Uh, broadly, a deacon, diakonos, literally means a servant, a, a humble servant. But as the church office, which Paul is addressing here to Timothy, and for him to communicate this to the, to the church at Ephesus, where he is uh, shepherding left there to pastor these people there, he says that deacons, which the word here is, is a masculine word, it's diakonos, 
are men who are responsible for the various forms of service. These include things like the financial oversight, which they, by the way, work along with the elders because the elders also had that responsibility. According to Acts chapter 11, verse 30, when they had that collection to take to the people in Judea because they were facing such a famine and the people were really hard up and they took up a collection. And so the elders were involved in that, of course, too. But here the deacons oversee some of the administrative responsibilities and the caring for the physical needs of the congregation so that they can help free up the elders to do more of the spiritual work of the ministry of prayer and of the word. And here Paul sets forth nine qualifications for those involved in the office of deacon, including four qualities of their wives or, or women who would assist in the ministry. This list, by the way, should be pointed out here, like the one that was given for the elders, focuses on character more than even the actual duties. But let's take a look at them, these nine qualities, starting here in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, it says, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. And then let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Back in verse 8, the first qualification is that they must be dignified, meaning worthy of respect. The King James Version uses the word grave. As you're reading that, you're thinking, what does he mean by grave? The word grave simply means to be sober. Deacons, in other words, must realize the seriousness of the work that they have been entrusted to do. A second qualification, deacons must be sincere. Literally, the text says, not be double-tongued. In other words, not devious in their speech. They must not say one thing to one person and then the opposite to someone else, but rather they have to be honest and sincere. Thirdly, like the uh, qualifications for the elders, deacons also must not be addicted to wine or other substance abuse. Number four, they must not be greedy for dishonest gain. This quality has to do with their motives for serving. Their service must not be for selfish gain, in other words. So it's an attitude, it's a motive, especially with the responsibilities that they would have to do. Number five is a very important. In verse nine, we find there that most important of all, deacons must be men of spiritual depth. While deacons are not required to be able to teach like the elders, they are, however, to uh, be able to have a good grasp of the gospel and that their behavior would be consistent with the gospel. Number six, deacons must first be tested, proved, uh, presumably under the leadership uh, of the elders, according to, to verse 10 here. Uh, Paul's intent here, of course, is, is not to require some uh, formal testing procedure, but rather, really, it's, it's that these men prove their quality over time and in the ordinary, natural activities of everyday life and ministry. 
Number seven, they themselves must, must show themselves to be blameless. Although, again, they're not perfect, but they should be free from accusation or charge against them. Number eight, the deacon must be, again, that very difficult statement that he's making, but the clarity here is they must be a man of one wife, literally. Uh, the husband of one wife. They must maintain moral purity in their lives. If, again, of course, if they're the ones, they're married. And also, number nine, if they have children. Deacons married with children, it says, verse 12, must be able to manage their own children in households well. In other words, they must be capable managers of their own families. Okay. Let's step back just a moment, though. Come back to verse 11, because placed in this context is this verse about where Paul inserts four qualifications for the wives of deacons or women who assist in ministry. Here they are. It says, these women must, first of all, be worthy of respect or dignified. The word is dignified. Uh, they must not be malicious talkers. They must not be slanderers. Thirdly, they must be sober-minded. In other words, temperate or, uh, again, well-balanced in words and action. And then finally, they must be trustworthy, trustworthy or faithful in all things. Four qualifications. And so Paul concludes in verse 13 this instruction saying that deacons who fulfill their servant roles faithfully gain two things. And this is the beautiful part about it. First of all, they gain an excellent standing before fellow Christians who understand and appreciate the beauty of humble and selfless and Christ-like service that they exhibit. They also gain a great, secondly, a great assurance of their faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying serving well builds confidence in the sincerity of their own faith in Christ. And indeed, it really does. And that's what it takes for that kind of servant leadership. Well, finally, as we conclude here, we come to the third area or group of people, and that's the rest of us. What about the rest of us here, all of us as believers? Uh, what does it take for us as believers in general to exercise servant leadership? Paul compacts several phrases and terms to describe the responsibilities of believers in the church here in verses 14 to 16. Verse 14, he says, look, I, Timothy, I hope to come to you soon over there at Ephesus. But I am writing these things to you now so that, what? If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. That is the theme of this whole letter for the believers. That's why he wrote this letter, by those, that phrase right there, how you ought to conduct yourself, how believers ought to conduct themselves in the household of God. In other words, how, how we ought to behave ourselves. For Timothy, the main theme would be, Timothy chapter 1, fight the good fight. Hang in there, Timothy. But for all the believers of whom you've been called, those in the church, all of us, how we are to behave ourselves, how we are conduct ourselves in the household of God. And then he talks about it, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of truth and the mystery of godliness. And he gives 
verse 16, those words, let's talk about that for a moment. These five things. This is the five responsibilities that all of us have. Number one, how one ought to conduct or behave ourselves. Verse 15. Paul appropriately sums up actually all the instruction that he's given to Timothy to give to the people to address throughout this letter. And Lord willing, we come back next week, July 1st, looking at chapter 4 and a couple weeks in chapter 5, where he's going to lay out more and more of these instructions of what we're to do. He appropriately summarizes it here, though, and he warns also, by the way, against the false teachers, reminding believers that true doctrine, true truth, leads to right living. And so, he tells us how we ought to behave and conduct ourselves. Secondly, the household. He uses the term household. What's he mean by that? He's describing the church and its ministry as God's family, especially with reference to authority and responsibility within the church and within the home. The stress here is on God's authority and then the behavior of his people in the church. Again, as we'll talk more about it, chapters 4 through 6. Number three, the third phrase he packs in here. He mentions the words, church of the living God. What's he mean by that? Highlights, as the church of the living God, he highlights the church as the gathering, the ecclesia of God's people, and it's mostly clearly here shown and revealed in the presence. And when God's people come together, we sense God's presence. And that's why it is so crucial and important that God's people do gather face to face, present together, and to worship him and to know and sense and experience the very presence of God among his people. Number four, Paul says that the church is the pillar and buttress of truth. For those of you, if you're in architecture or you're builders or you're, you're contractors or in construction and you put up, think about the architecture here, the pillar and the buttress of truth. God has entrusted the church with the task of promoting and protecting the gospel. It pictures the church responsibility as actually holding up the gospel like a pillar, and where, some, where the watching world could see it, and also repelling against the attacks of the false teachers. And so you can see here the role of advancing the gospel is a divinely given one to the church. We are responsible. Finally, number, number five. Verse 16, Paul speaks of the mystery of godliness. What's he mean by that? The term mystery simply means something that was hidden in the past and has now been revealed. And it's the mystery of the gospel. It's the mystery of godliness, he says in verse 16, referring to that entire content of God's revealed plan for salvation. So Paul goes on here with poetic exp exposition and explanation of that great message. And you know what? Paul appears here in verse 16 to be quoting an ancient hymn. We have the words of a first century hymn. The lyrics and so now, worship team, all you need to do is take these words and put it to music for us, okay? Here it is, right here. Six lines. Line number one says, He was vindicated in the flesh. This is talking about Christ. It says that God the Son has been revealed. 
He's come to us. He's come in his first coming. Line number two. Boy, this is great theology. Putting theology and scripture to music, to words. He says here he was vindicated by the Spirit, which affirms that Jesus was vindicated by the resurrection. Where are we getting that? Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was declared with power by the Spirit, by his what? Resurrection from the dead. Line 3 says he was seen by angels. In other words, afterward, he was displayed in victory before the, all the heavenly beings. Lines 4 and 5. He was proclaimed among the nations and believed on in the world. In other words, in line 4, it speaks of the message of the gospel that to this day continues to be proclaimed among all the nations. In line five, it is effective as people are continuing to believe in Christ. And finally, in line six, it refers to Jesus' ascension and it presents a foretaste of Christ's exaltation. And that's why it says he was taken up in glory. And there you have it. God, you see, wants us to know these truths, to live these truths, to proclaim these truths of servant leadership. This is what it takes to exercise servant leadership, whether serving as elders or deacons or all of us as believers in general, this is what it takes to become more and more the people and the church that God desires and wants us to be. Servant leadership, this is what it takes to carry out those responsibilities that God has entrusted to us. And you know what? It's always for the benefit of others, for our families, our community, and our world. As we close, would you stand with me for our benediction? I want to thank you for taking some bearing with through this passage as it is so much here, but I pray that God would use it to help and encourage you. It was George Bullard that said, vision, vision is a movement of God that is memorable, a movement of God that is memorable with your help as a church, with the help of our church leaders and many people, and finally a couple of our church people bringing this together, the vision of this church, we are a church that brings hope and encouragement of Jesus Christ. We are a church that brings hope and encouragement of Jesus Christ. I hope that's true of you. But it doesn't stop there. It's to the surrounding area. The surrounding area. Hope and encouragement to people in the surrounding area through evangelism, discipleship, and prayer. And I thank you for being a part of that. And so now with that, may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Thank you. We are dismissed.